Okay, good evening, everybody. First thing on the agenda is approval of the agenda. Can I get a motion? I move to approve the agenda as presented. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 And Ms. Jane Towers, looks like you're on for all the rest of the <laughs> right. balance of the agenda, correct? Yes, I'm in the hot seat tonight. All right. <laughs> good evening, President Schiffinelli, board members, executive team. My name is Jane Towers, CFO. Uh, tonight we bring before you some information that we would like to review regarding uh, draft state aid numbers that we received. So the first topic is going to be your draft state aid breakdown. So as you know, we have two major source of funds in our operating budget. That's going to be our um, maintenance of effort through the county as well as our state aid. Our state aid here is listed in blue highlighted under the different buckets that you can see here. When we compare this to last year, it's an increase of $1.3 million. Now, the state has given us these numbers as of 12-31-22, with a caveat that these are subject to change based upon legislation. And there has been some errors that have been in the calculations that have been relayed to the state and more updates are to come. In your opinion, is it gonna go up or down? I mean, it it's frozen at the same level as last year, so maintenance of effort will be the same, if not more. So we can only go in a positive way, meaning we'll have more funds. Correct. Yes. yes. So I can go over each different buckets here listed, or we can take a look at the actual county state aid that was given to us. So it's completely up to you. We can dive in and talk about how foundations calculated, or we can uh, just know that it's a 1.3 increase from last year. There is one item of note. The first, this is going to be the first year in 24 that Queen Anne's County Public Schools will qualify for the concentration of poverty grant. This concentration of poverty grant is identified by a school, and this school is Sellersville Elementary School. So, concentration of poverty grant, it provides more resources to the schools gives an extra 272,823. And the idea being that one community coordinator will be there at the school in addition to providing uh, additional resources such as that meets the needs of the schools. Some items that would qualify would be maybe guidance counselor, um, vision and dental care, which we currently have those, mentors, psychologists, any other type of restorative practices. So that is something that will be new to Queen Anne's County, that we will be eligible for one of our schools. For so those, those funds have parameters of how we can spend it? Correct. Okay. Columns two, three, and four, we don't qualify for. Why? Based upon the calculation, the column G, it, um, column two is what they call a GCI. And that's based upon the cost of services outside the county compared to ours and in, in, in inflation, and we didn't qualify for this year. The blueprint transition grant, I'll have to take a look at that and the wage index. We haven't qualified for those in the past, but I can provide the, the calculations on those. They're usually targeted specific into the law, so I have to find out why we didn't qualify for those. Under transportation, are they considering our rising fuel costs? because is that in the state calculation that you know we're at, i'm just saying 350 and now it's 450 or five dollars for diesel fuel are they considering it, that's a major it does escalate every year as far as the cost per per um per student that rides the bus but it's never enough it's never it never meets the total cost of transportation because when you look at the transportation line at um 4.3 here it it doesn't cover in our operating budget that so under our foundation and with county appropriations, that makes up the difference to fund the whole transportation category nine. And I mean, I just, I mean, I, it is what it is, but we're a very rural county and there's some other ones too, but you take these more, you know, dense, but they don't have the same issues we have as far as, cause they have public transportation. They also have other means of getting to school, even walking. And it's, I think we're hundred percent bus. Correct. Correct. And while we're on transportation, it may not be the time. It may be a SID question or maybe not, but is there a state law that I've just noticed uh, was behind a school bus and there was a house right next to the school and the school bus stopped to pick up the child and then 100 feet later turned right into the school. Is there some law that says that we need to pick up children at, outside their homes? Because I'm wondering if we can save money by and wear and tear in our buses and gas by not stopping every... What age? 
Um, it was middle school. Because I know that for elementary school, they drop right. them off at their driveway. Right. It was middle school. Okay. I'd have, there, it's not a state law. We have county guidelines set up of distance um, of how many feet away for walking and how many stops within a certain amount of space. I'd have to look at that particular bus that you're talking about in school that you're talking about to see if there was an IEP or some kind mm -hmm. of, right. you know. Yeah, I know that there's probably lots of parameters, but I just thought. For the middle school, that's kind of, I would say this is very rare to see. Okay. The picking up yeah. right outside of a, of a middle school. Um, but if you give me the number at all, I can look into it. Yeah. But there's well, no state guidelines. We set them by the camera. <laughs> I can Sorry. tell you where I saw it, but I didn't that's see fine. the number of the bus. But that's all right. And, yeah. and one thing on, on the horizon, too, that's been passed through legislation but doesn't start in a couple of years, and Mr. Pender can probably speak to this more, and then maybe you've probably heard about the electric buses that are going to be required in the next couple of years. And just to even get the infrastructure in place, it's still a scramble at the state level of how they're going to fund that. So I didn't know if you wanted to expand on that. We, um, Mr. Pender and Mr. Murdoch has applied for different grants to actually pay for school buses as they cycle out. Yeah, we, in two more years, are supposed to go to, they're mandating all electric buses, but you're talking going from a bus that costs about 130000 to $400,000. Sure. And then you're also talking about infrastructure of, with Delmarva Power, that do we even have enough power out to the warehouse to supplement that? Mm -hmm. um, we did apply for a um, a grant, and uh, the only school system that got that grant was Baltimore City in the state of Maryland. Um, and if you look at around um, the state, it's all the metropolitan areas that got the, you know, received those grants. I should say, let me back up. Around the United States, it was all metropolitan areas. You didn't really see any rural areas, so there's going to be a lot to this if it does come to fruition of actually truly going to all electric in two years, which is going to be tough. When you say our school buses, are we talking contractors too? We're talking the state has mandated every school bus will be electric. Well, I, uh, what day? We, we don't leave. I mean, the contractors don't leave their buses at our warehouse or schools, and that's. I should say unintended consequences because, um, and you're exactly right. So how is that pay structure going to work? Is there even enough power at a, say if you have a contracted driver that has four buses at their house, is there even enough there to power that? I mean, it's, there's a lot to it and it's going to be an up and down roller coaster till we get to where we need to go. And Can they're expecting they this. have buses done. I mean, that there's going to be. Oh, the supply. They're expecting this the in two supply, years. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We There's can. already evidence to show rural areas like us, ours, can't have electric buses because then the kids go without heat. Because as soon as you turn on the heat, 40% of your battery goes away. <laughs> it, there's going to be some waivers. Well, I would expect <laughs> I to be, so. see some waivers because I don't ever see this coming through in you know two years, let alone five years. I mean, it's going to be a, mm. a long, drawn-out process. Is there an electric bus on the market at all now? Yes, all there is. But like I said, you're looking at the PVA that we currently pay for a bus, which, like I said, is you know 100, 110, 120,000. Now you're looking at 400 some thousand dollars. I mean, everything would have to be totally restructured, cost-wise, to make it you know uh, available. And then again, we pay per mile with a fuel rate. How does that look? with an electric rate, I mean. And then the repair. I mean, you know, everybody's working, working on a diesel and gas engine, but not a electric. Yeah. Oh, oh. Sorry, Sid, we're putting oh, you're all right. spot. Yeah. No, I did Thanks for the good news. Yeah. <laughs> so we're gonna get our kids to school one way or the other, right? <laughs> yes, sir. By <laughs> diesel or by electric, whatever. They'll be there. Yep. All right. Magic carpet. Just wanted to put that um, carpet, right. uh, information out there if you haven't already heard about that. One other thing that I want to, bring highlight to is your NBC teacher code here in column 14. Again, for 24, it's budgeted and projected out through the state at 26 teachers, and that's $10,000 per employee. So this is the rough draft that we have received so far from NSDE. We know it's gonna change, but wanted to share that with you.
Ms. Jane, one other question. The education effort adjustment, which is column 15, only three counties, what is that and why would only three counties qualify for that? Um, those are your, I think it's, again, I'll have to look at that. I don't know offhand. Okay. It looks okay. like, it looks like low income. Uh, oh. hmm. Too large, too uh, large in the Dorchester. I will email okay, that thank to you tonight. Thanks. And the next one we want to talk about is our funding from the county, which we call maintenance of effort. Maintenance of effort here that is listed and released by the state is 62,559,389. That is FY22 number. The state has said that this is going to go through legislation, that they know that it needs to be updated and more to come. Historically, in prior years, they have done uh, hold harmless where you would not see a decrease in funding from this current year. So this current year, we actually have received, let me pull out that dollar amount, 65. I take that back, 64,085,219. Is what we got last year. Is um, what we're currently in 23, yes. So we know this number is going to go up by how much we do not know yet. The next item in your budget book is going to be your average, five year average of expenditures for your review. So I'm not going to go line by line. I've been asked just to say that, it, take a look at it. If you have any in, in particular questions, just to send us an email, Dr. Stanley and myself, and we will actually break that down for you why there's a variance there. One thing that you have to be mindful of is those COVID years, because those COVID years may show a savings, but then when schools back up and running again, the actuals look a little higher than in prior years. The last couple of years, we used to send questions into you, then you post them on a ledger sheet or something. Yes. So all board members had access. I can it, do that it, this year. I mean, I just think if okay. you know one of us asks a question, the other members would at least see what's you know what the other members are asking, and you know, not, not be repetit not not ask you the same question over and over again. Okay. Definitely share that. Stars, is this uh, available on the website for public? It is actually on board docs. Okay. Listed okay. there. Yes. All right. So they can take a look at that. One thing when we look at expenditures that want to bring to everyone's attention is health care. So what page is that? That is actually a, a separate one that um, just want to bring to your attention and talk okay. about. It's listed under category 12. And if you go, it's 5810. And then it's going to be 5820 with the retirees on the last page. There. So as you know, we're part of ESMIC Healthcare Trust Alliance. ESMIC Healthcare Trust Alliance has a number of different boards on the shore as members. And what we saw this past year in FY22 was a high rate of claims compared to the premiums that were paid to the tune of $3.2 million in excess. We are partnered with the county on this, so we have to pull from reserves. Our reserve balance is 9.3. So out of that reserves, we're gonna pull 3.2. And there's an estimated loss for 23, because we, we wanna take a look at 23. What is there a loss and what is that projected loss? And that's gonna be another roughly 600,000. So we're looking at the, at the end of this year to have a 4.5 balance in our ESMIC healthcare trust reserves, which is lower than what Queen Anne's has historically been. There are parameters in place where they have a conservative reserve where you can only spend or allocate half of your reserves to offset premiums. So that would be around 2.5, $2.8 million that would be set aside. It, it just shows you that 
we're hoping that it's a COVID year, that everyone went back to the doctors, and then you're starting to see it come down at 3.2 last year. We're looking at 800,000 projected by Bolton Partners of where we'll have to go into reserves. It's, it's still a loss, but not as big as the, the 3.2 um, that we saw this year. So when Esmec Healthcare Trust met, they actually took a look at all the different types of co-pays and costs. And when the last time that they increased or and there are some that haven't increased in over five to seven years. So in order to help offset those, those costs in future years, there's going to be some increases in not the co-pays to doctor's offices, but to co-pays to, let's say, urgent care, emergency rooms, in, inpatient hospital stay, just uh, different things like that to, to try to offset what we're seeing now. <laughs> So we're looking at in healthcare for next year, projection to increase anywhere between five and a half to six percent. When you say three million or three point two million, last year we took one point five or six away. So yes. we're saying we're taking that same thing away again next year, plus adding another million and a half. Um, how, how how they how they do it is that they, they settle out and then they base their claims and projections on the current year. So it, it's, it's a little different as far as how it calculates with fund balance. So this year they're projecting or going to request from the board if we use around 900,000. So it's not going to be cumulative, but it's just going to be for that year. Okay. Because we, we, if, we, if, we, if it doesn't go down, it's a cost that we have to look at. It is a reoccurring cost. It has to be replaced somehow. And if you keep exactly. getting out of fund balances, it's going to come to a slow end or a quick end at the way we're going. Yes, correct, correct. So just wanted to talk to you about that, what we're seeing with health care, watching it closely with ESMIC Healthcare Trust, with Bolton Partners, a partnership with Everside. We're hoping that will help with um, these costs so we're not seeing a emergency room visits like we're seeing now. Uh, we looked at also any high flyers. Is there a reason why? Is there a couple that have had um, a high claims rate? Not anything out of the ordinary. It's just a lot of people going back and a lot of people using the emergency room. Do you think that we're going to get some numbers um, in the future with the chop tank and the Eversides to see what type of savings that we've, uh, if we've seen or not seen any savings from the programs that we've put in place? We, we can definitely um, be able to pull that information because they partner with Bolton and Bolton partner is our actually third party administrator of the, our healthcare trust plan. So I will definitely ask that of them and, and we will make sure we get some data on that. And Eversight is slated end of April, beginning of May to open up. Okay, nice. So just wanted to kind of recap the budget process, what we've done so far. Starting in November, we looked at this at asking for school requests, supervisors requests on needed items for the upcoming year. There was a review of classroom sizes. We looked at enrollment data. We actually reviewed staffing too as well. The next step is to, to see any board priorities that you might have too as well when we build the budget. One thing that is included in your budget book and, and online is the actual raw data request by schools. So you can see that too as well. And if you have any um, priorities or things that you see, if you want to maybe talk about on the 22nd or email Dr. Salins and myself on that. And on the 22nd, there's going to be the capital budget meeting to review our capital request with the county. With all the litigation we went through last year and the contracts with our um, teachers and support people, what's our total up from every, you know, what we are obligated to this year? What's, what's the number? Okay. So uh, in your budget books and online, you will see a draft salary projection for the current year or upcoming year for 24. And the total projection is going to be around 3.1 million increase in salary with roughly four to four fifty in uh, fringe. So one the one four fifty is into one point three point one? 
So about, it's about 3.5 to 3.6 that is in just to sustain salary increases. For three and a half million dollars. For next year, 3.6. And that's, that's just staffing at the same level we are today. Correct, based upon the negotiated agreements. And it, it has uh, confidential salary information on there so we can get in total amount, but. No, I did. I'm, I'm just trying to look at the big number. Yeah. I mean, when you, you know, when we look at maintenance of effort, if you stay stable, then you add another three and a half here, you got transportation, you got health, you know, and some other things, it's, it's getting pricey. It is. And then like what you've talked about before with inflation and fuel costs too, yeah. that's going to be our high flyers. Is there any other data that I can provide for you or, or show you as we work on building the budget from here? No, I have some questions, but I'll, I'll email them with our, sure. so we don't do duplicates and take up too much time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. So did we get through everything? 3.4? 3.04? All right, just double checking. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Ms. Tanner. Thank you. Okay, there's no action items on the agenda. Future meetings, uh, we canceled next week, right? So February yes. 22nd, and that's at 5.30 or 6 p.m.? What time does it start? 4.30? That'll be with the closed session? Yes. And so, uh, go ahead. Okay, pursuant. We do it before we close. Thank you. I move that. Yeah, pursuant to the general provisions, Article 3-305 and 3-104, the Board of Education of Queen Anne's County will meet in a closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom this public body has jurisdiction, any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals, to consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. Second. All right, the motion is second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right, good evening, everybody. Thanks.